The bandsaw, hands down the most essential machine in my entire workshop. And today I would like to show you how I actually set this thing up from blade selection to tracking, to bearing adjustment, to aligning the table, everything you need to know to get this thing running smoothly and accurately. So let's get going. So the machine that I'm running here is the Axminster SBW4300, which has been superseded by a newer model, but this one is absolutely amazing. I'll be doing a review of it in the future, but if you're interested in owning one of these things or the newer model, there is a link in the description to where you can get hold of one of them. Just to answer a question that I know is gonna pop up in the comments below, Matt, why do you prioritize owning a bandsaw as opposed to a table saw? I've already answered that question. There is a link to a blog post in the description where you can find out my long answer to that question. For now, let's get stuck into blade selection. So when you first buy a bandsaw, it is gonna come fitted with a blade straight out the factory. And this is probably the most important advice I'm gonna give you in the entire video. Replace it. Get rid of that blade that comes in the machine. In 95% of cases, it's trash. You do not want to be using it. It's going to track, it's going to get blunt, and your results are going to be awful from it. I don't care if you've bought a hobby machine, if you've bought a higher spec machine such as this. In 95% of cases, blade is rubbish. You want to replace it with one, it doesn't have to be expensive. In the UK, you can get a decent blade for 10 to 15 pounds, and it'll be much better than the one that is supplied in the machine. Best bit of advice is replace that blade. And yes, I know this does seem like a little bit of a waste. I changed mine into a sandpaper dispenser. It can cut through paper. <laughs> That's all it's got going for it, to be honest. If you wanna see how I made this thing, there's a link in the description below. So when choosing a bandsaw blade, you've got three specifications to choose from. The first one is obviously the length. I've wrapped these up to make them easier to store and I'll show you how to do that later. So the length is pretty easy. It's anything that can fit over the top tire, round the bottom tire within the tensioning range of the machine, which I will cover later. Get this accurate. You can find that length either on the data sheet, which is probably somewhere on the back of the machine or in the instruction manual or website that you purchased the machine from. The second specification is the width of the blade from front to back. Now again, this varies on different machines, specifically the capacity of the thrust wheel at the back, which we'll be covering later on. That machine can take anything up to three quarters of an inch wide, which is around about 19 millimeters, whereas on smaller benchtop models or hobby models, they usually only go up to a maximum of five eighths of an inch or even half an inch. So why does this matter? Well, if you're wanting to cut intricate shapes such as this, let's say bowl blanks, fine ornaments, I don't know, whatever, then you're going to be wanting a thin bandsaw blade around about a quarter of an inch thick, which is going to be able to follow those radiuses a lot easier. Whereas if you're cutting straight lines, which is what I primarily do on the bandsaw, then you're gonna to want to get as wide of a blade as possible and just max out your machine. I usually keep a three quarter of an inch on here because like I say, I do a lot of straight rips on the bandsaw. And if you're one of the many people who wants to do curved cuts and straight cuts without getting an individual bandsaw blade for both, then just get one in the middle, three eighths of an inch, five eighths of an inch, perfect sizes, and we'll be able to do both of these to a good extent. Now, my personal preference for this is to have a three eighths of an inch thick general purpose blade, which I will use for my curve cuts and I'll use for my straight cuts where I don't need to be super accurate with it, but I just wanna get the job done. And then what I'll do is have a dedicated three quarters of an inch thick blade as wide as possible for all of my straight cuts where I need to be accurate. The reason I reserve a wider blade for those dedicated straight cuts where I need it to be accurate is because if I was to use a general purpose blade for those sort of jobs where on that general purpose blade, perhaps I've been cutting bowl blanks to size, what tends to happen is people have a bias to rotate curved objects in one direction. For me, I tend to do it clockwise. For other people, providing the bandsaw has the capacity, they'll tend to prefer it anti-clockwise. By having this bias, what you're doing is wearing down one side of the blade more than the other. So if I was to do this with my general purpose blade and then go straight into wanting to cut accurate straight lines, what's gonna happen is that general purpose blade is gonna want to track side to side because one side of the blade is sharper than the other. So then when I want to cut those really straight and accurate lines, I switch to my dedicated blade that is for cutting straight lines with no curves whatsoever, wide as possible with as low of a TPI as possible as well. 
which we will cover now. The TPI refers to the amount of teeth per inch, which is what TPI stands for. The lower the teeth per inch, then the course of the blade. The higher the teeth per inch, the finer the blade. So if my work primarily involved cutting thin bits of MDF, thin bits of plywood, thin bits of plastic, then I would opt for a higher TPI, which is a finer blade because it's gonna give a better edge on that material and because it's thin, it's not gonna clog up the blade as much. Whereas if I was to use that fine blade to cut a bit of material this thick, then there's not gonna be enough space between the teeth to collect the sawdust and that blade is gonna track, it's gonna burn and it's, it's not gonna be nice. So because most of my work involves cutting wood, whether it's this thick or if it's resawing this thick, then I tend to opt for a lower TPI blade because that is what most of my work calls for. And you can still use that low TPI for your plastics, for your MDFs, but you just need to be prepared to have a bit more of a ragged edge compared to what you would get from a finer TPI. So my personal preference for both my general purpose blade and for my ripping blade that is dedicated for straight cuts is on my straight ripping blade, I tend to opt for as low of a TPI as possible. On here, we've got a four TPI, but later on, we're gonna be fitting a three TPI, which is extremely coarse. But as you'll see in this video, if we set the machine up correctly, you can actually get that to be a pretty good finish. Now, the finish of it doesn't matter too much because when I put things through this machine, it usually ends up going through the planar thickness or anyway. So it's gonna clean up those faces regardless. For my general purpose blade, the three quarter inch one, which is for curved cuts and straight cuts, I've opted for a variable tooth pitch on this, which varies from six TPI to 10 TPI. This one is the Axminster Premium Bandsaw Blade and the finish that you get from it is unbelievable. It is glass smooth. The six TPI part cuts quickly, the 10 TPI cleans it up. So in summary, once you get the length of your bandsaw blade sorted, the rest of it's up to you. Width, you can choose depending on your work and the TPI, you can choose depending on your work. Now, obviously, a lot of you won't actually know where to start with this. You don't know what your work calls for. I would suggest just going for a 3 8 of an inch wide blade, which is good for your general purpose straight cuts and your curved cuts, and then go for something like a six TPI, usually a good starting point. And then once you've sort of got a general idea, you can choose whether you want to go to a thinner blade or a wider blade or a coarser blade or a finer blade. Up to you. Now let's get into swapping out this blade. So on the back, on my model, I've got a quick detensioner and then you can sort of fine adjust the tension of the machine using this hand wheel here. So if we look inside here, if we detension the blade, then the top wheel goes down and as you tension it, it goes up and applies tension to the blade. And then here's the fine adjustment. Now on this machine, it's quite tricky to get the wider blades out because they get caught in the mouth quite easily. So what I do is raise the blade guard up so it is level with the center of the wheel detension the blade so there's nothing on it whatsoever and then that's given me a lot of room here to sort of get this bandsaw blade out and round this corner and out this mouthpiece whereas if the guard's all the way down here then you've just sort of got like this little area and the bearings are restricting it and everything it becomes quite difficult and to make this even easier i'm going to move these bearings right out the way so that i've got as much room as possible to get this blade out. You've also got two bearings under the table, which are perhaps the worst culprits for this. And this is where the slow dance with your bandsaw blade begins. You take it off the top wheel, thread it through that blade guard at the front and get it released. Round the side here, and this is coming out the side of the door. Carefully unhook it from the bottom wheel as well. And there we go, that's loose. And then carefully get it round this corner and out the slot on the table. And although it can sometimes be a pain getting that blade around the right angle bend in order to come out this bit in the side, some models will have the blade slot coming out the front here, but it means you've got to take off this fence assembly in order to get the blade out, which is just, it's an extra step in the process. It's not a huge pain, but yeah, just bear that in mind when you're looking at buying a bandsaw. And one thing that I would say is it's always nicer to do this process with some gloves on, especially this wrapping up part. Now, some people are just able to hold the bandsaw blade like this, twist it and then they get it into a perfect coil. I am not one of those people, I'm not that confident. What I tend to do is just stand on the bandsaw blade like that, hold it in your hand with your palm facing out and then just twist it. And then what should happen <laughs> eventually, there we go, that one worked, is you get a nice little coil like that. Like I say, it's a lot nicer with gloves on though. Then that just hangs up on the wall next to my bandsaw. 
very carefully and then we'll get unwrapping this three TPI monster. Now, a lot of people questioned my method of doing this in a previous video, which was cutting up a log. I'll put a link to that in the description. The way that I prefer to unwrap these blades is just by lobbing it out in front of me. Do not try and unwrap this in your hands. You saw how much tension was in that thing as I tried to wrap it up then. If you've got this in your hands when you try and unwrap it, it's gonna whip and you don't know which way that's gonna go. Quite likely it's gonna hit you in the face or the wrist or just somewhere where you don't wanna get hit by a nice, sharp, pristine blade such as this. My method, lob it as far away from me as possible and let it do its thing, settle, and then I'll pick it up. So if you've got a sheet of MDF or something soft to lay on the ground before you do this, then it's probably better than just chucking this straight onto concrete, which is what people got offended by in my last video. But there you go, I'll show you it now. It makes a horrible sound, I warn you. So I get it started to unwrap in my hands and then just lob it. There you go, unwrapped and my face is intact. And then we simply repeat the process that we did before, but in reverse. Just before you do this, double check that the blade isn't inside out. If it's inside out, then the teeth are going to be facing up when you install it in the machine, which obviously isn't gonna do them any good. So just make sure that the teeth will be going down towards the table when you install it. So before we start tensioning the blade, one thing I need to do is just remove that thrust wheel and get it out the way so that there's nothing distorting this blade once it's pulled to tension. And don't forget to do the one at the bottom as well. Get that one out the way of the blade as we tension it. So then to apply tension to that blade, we'll pull the lever down and then just tighten up this wheel. Now there is a tensioning scale here, which you can see being adjusted, but to be honest, I don't really trust that thing. In fact, I don't actually know what the numbers represent. One to 10, one to 10 what? Tightness? How long's a piece of string? I, I don't know what that means. What I tend to do is just tension it to a point where that, I've got like a general rule for how much deflection that needs there. You shouldn't really check the tension around the mouth because you have got the bearings to contend with. I mean, I've pulled them right out of the way, but the amount of tension you can feel depends so much on where you hold the blade within the mouth and how high up these bearings are. It's a lot more consistent to check the tension here. And I do it so you can push the blade about five millimeters or so without too much pressure needed. And I know that's very vague, but you tend to get a feel for it. Like it's when you have to put excessive force to push the blade anymore. There you go, that feels about right there. So I'll push the blade about five millimeters to the side and then any more force than that is just sort of like, it's a bit too much. If you were to be pressing a button on your washing machine and you had to push it that much, you'd feel like, yeah, that'd be right. But if you have to push it anymore, you're like, I might break it if I push it more than that. That's kind of what the rule that you go for with the bandsaw blade. Like I say, you get a feel for it eventually, but yeah, that'd be all right. Okay, so now we've got the tension of the blade sorted. It's now time to sort out the tracking on this top wheel. And I'm gonna draw a quick diagram for this. <laughs> So if this piece of sellotape is the bandsaw tire, we're gonna be looking at it from this angle. And the profile that you see when you look at the wheel from this angle is front face, back face, and then you've got a crowned circumference round the edge of that wheel. Now, when I was first shown how to set up a bandsaw, I was told to have the blade tracking in the center of that wheel. So it's resting like that, obviously wrapping round it. But can you see the problem with that? The teeth are gonna be on this cutting edge here and there's not a lot of support underneath them. The main part of the blade that's getting the tension is right in the middle. Now, this was something that I'm not gonna take credit for. This was something that I saw in a video by Mark Spagnolo, and he did a collaboration with Alec Snodgrass, I think his name was, Snodgrass? I don't actually know his name, but I'll put a link to it in the description. He said that if I draw another wheel, he said that actually what you want to do is have the bandsaw blade in a position where the teeth are in the center of the blade and then the rest of it overhangs at the back like this. Specifically, the area of the teeth that you want in the center of the wheel is, if I draw the teeth on here, you want this part to be in the center of the wheel, which are called the gullets. 
that bit has to run in the center of the wheel, not actually on the teeth themselves because or else it's gonna chop up that tire. Now, word of warning here, this doesn't always work because by the time you get that bandsaw blade back far enough on the tire for the gullets of the teeth to be in line with the center of that wheel, you can't always get the thrust wheel back far enough in order to accommodate for that. Most bandsaws, when they specify that they can take a maximum capacity of, let's say three quarters of an inch thick, that maximum capacity refers to when the wheel is resting centrally on the blade, not when it's shifted back, like I just showed in that diagram over there. With my bandsaw, it's usually okay. So now we've tensioned it, as I showed you in the previous step, we're gonna get spinning that wheel with our hands. And then on the back, you've got a hand wheel that you can turn, which is going to tilt that wheel forwards or backwards in order to adjust the tracking. And then on here, I've got like a locking lever as well, so I can prevent that from slipping over time. So I can look through this little window and then adjust that wheel as needed. So I can see it moving forward there. I need to turn it the other way, probably about there, I reckon. Now I know a lot of critics out there will think, ah, but by resting the teeth in the center of the wheel, you're gonna be damaging the kerf, which is something that I thought to begin with. But if I draw a blade from plan view, so that's the back of it, that's the right hand side, that's the left hand side, and then we've got the kerf down here. So that's one tooth on top. And then we've got another tooth coming out from behind it. And obviously that alternates with the wheel resting on this part of the blade. If I add that curve onto it, there you go. You can see that there is actually gonna be a little bit of relief for the kerf of that wheel without it pressing excessively on it and therefore damaging it. All the pressure is there, therefore that is where you get the most amount of tension. It's an ideal setup really. So now we've got the tension and the tracking sorted, we're gonna focus our attention on the bearings below and get that blade running continuously straight. So the first thing that I do is get the front to back distance of these front bearings sorted first. Now mine moves on one whole assembly. I loosen the one at the back and there you go. It moves as one. And you want to get these running just below the gullets on the teeth. You don't want them riding over the teeth because that's gonna just destroy the kerf. Just below the gullets, right about there. So we'll lock that in place, being careful not to let it move. And then we'll turn our attention to the bottom ones and we'll do exactly the same. We'll get that just below the gullets. And then we need to sort out how close these actually sit to the bandsaw blade. And what you're aiming for here is as close as possible without touching the blade. So I'll do that now, just spin that round a bit. The adjustment on bandsaws varies a lot. Some of them are quite nice and easy, such as this, whereas others can be a little bit fiddly. So I'll get that really close about there and then lock it off. Same with the other. In fact, I think I can get this one even closer. And then to check how you did, simply spin the wheel. And if it touches any of those bearings, which this isn't, that's ideal, then that's good. What you occasionally find at this point is if you spin the wheel, it will sort of like hit the bearing every now and then, but it will only do it like on one rotation of the blade. You kind of want to avoid this from happening as well. Just back off that bearing a tiny bit more because when this machine's running at full speed, then that's gonna happen more often, obviously. Same once again on the bottom ones, get them as close as possible without touching. Lovely. So now what we should have is a free running blade, but then with a tiny bit of pressure, that's gonna engage those bearings. So what these side bearings are doing is preventing that bandsaw blade from tracking when you're cutting, let's say, along the grain on a piece of wood. It's preventing it from drifting, I suppose. Also, because we set up the tracking on the wheel above to be in this position, the bearings are now supporting the blade sort of around here, and they're stopping that back area from being able to twist too much. So yes, that area is unsupported. It has potential to wobble, but by getting those bearings as close as possible without touching, then it's not gonna have the room to twist excessively. It's not gonna do miracles, obviously, but that is the number one reason why bandsaws don't perform as accurately as they should do. It's because the bearings aren't set up at all, and that blade is just doing what it wants between that wheel and that wheel, which is quite a big distance. So what we have now is two pairs of bearings that are in the perfect distance from front to back and side to side as well. But what we also have is an unsupported blade from behind. As soon as forwards pressure is put on this blade, it's gonna push it back between those bearings and then it's just gonna start steamrolling over the kerf of that bandsaw blade and completely write it off. This is where the back bearing, also known as the thrust wheel, can come in. 
You move that forward, and once again, we want that as close as possible to the blade without touching. And I've got some nice little windows here where I can check that distance. So we'll lock that in, give the wheel a spin, and okay, I reckon I could get that a bit closer. Okay, so that's just catching there. You can kind of hear it. See, it's not often, but we don't want that happening when the machine's running. So just back a smidge more. This will just be a tiny kink in the bandsaw blade, which isn't anything unusual. They're not perfectly straight. There we go. That's good. And once again, we want to do the same for this one in the bottom as well. Close as possible without touching. It's going to be my catchphrase for this video. All right, so that's all the bearings set up and spinning beautifully. Now, to be honest, at this point, you could just stop the video and you'll be done with it. If you do this to your machine, it's going to run absolutely beautifully. However, there are a few further upgrades that you can do to take your machine to just that extra level. So I'll show you those now. What it needs to do first is just pop the mouthpiece in, make sure there's no rubbish around here. That's going to make it sit proud. Pop that in, make sure that's sitting nice and straight so that it's less likely to start chopping up the edges. That's a nice reason to set up the bearings as well. As soon as this gets all chopped up, then you start losing material down there, which is a bit of a pain. So we've done that. And then this table also comes with this little thing, which goes into that slot on the edge. The reason for this is because they've made an exit path for the bandsaw blade, effectively what they've had to do is partially cut the table in half, which means there's potential for it to twist perhaps. And by shoving this thing in, it's going to keep everything aligned and prevent you from getting like a step or anything happening over this area. So firstly, I'm going to make sure that the blade is actually cutting square to the table. And I tend to use an engineer's square for this. Nice and simple. Rest it up against the side of the blade and should tell you if it's cutting square or not, which that is. That's all good. Let's try it from this angle just in case. Looks good to me, that's spot on. It's important to use an engineer's square for this rather than a tri-square because an engineer's square is guaranteed to be square on the outside edge, providing you get a good brand. It's guaranteed to be square there, whereas a wooden tri-square is only guaranteed to be square on this inside edge. The outside edge is not guaranteed to be square. A little extra tip for you there. And in fact, Alex had a really good tip on how to do this in Mark Spagnolo's video, which I'll show to you now. Obviously, this is the first time I'm going to be turning on this machine since setting it up. So as a checklist, make sure you've done the tensioning, make sure you've done the tracking, make sure you've set the side bearings and make sure you've set the thrust wheel at the back. Once you've done all that, it should be OK to turn on. Just make sure you got your goggles just in case. Voila! So now the machine's running, I'll just check that the bearings aren't rubbing anywhere. In fact, it looks like the bottom thrust wheel at the back is touching just a tiny little bit. So the test cut simply involves getting a nice long flat bit of wood like this, which will span a good distance across the table of your bandsaw. And then I'll lower the guard to sit about five millimeters above the surface of that wood. This is one for safety and two, it gets those bearings closer to the bearings below the table, which means there's less of a chance for this blade to drift between the top and bottom guides. So that looks good there. So then what we'll do is a cut from the front going about 10 millimeters in, rotate the piece around 180 degrees, and then it should re-enter into the bandsaw blade from behind. If this table is out of square, then it's going to cut on an angle when I come in from the front. And then when I try and push it in from the back, it's going to exaggerate that angle by twice the amount and it will become very apparent if it's out of square. So moment of truth. Let's let the blade stop. There you go. Straight in, that's all good. Now, some of you may have noticed this orange strip, which is attached to my bandsaw doesn't fit the overall color scheme. What this is, is a bandsaw buddy and is the final step in setting up this machine to an optimum standard. And I'll show you how to use it now. This thing has two magnets attached to it, which is how I attach it to my bandsaw. And then in front of those magnets, there's a little strip here. Now I mentioned the kerf of the saw blade earlier, and that is what this strip is made to accommodate. The magnets will magnetize to the blade 
and then the kerf will sit in that little groove on the bandsaw buddy as opposed to sitting flat against the surface below and therefore scraping on the blade and not providing an accurate reading. An accurate reading for what? I hear you ask. Well, by moving this guard up and out the way, what I can then do is slide the fence in and lock it down next to that bandsaw buddy. And what you may be able to see is that I've got a gap here of about three millimeters, yet the bandsaw buddy is touching at the back. The blade is not aligned to this fence. And to sort that out, most fences have adjustment bolts at the front here, which you loosen off, and then that will allow you to re-square the fence, or should I say realign the fence to the blade. So now that fence is gonna skew to wherever I want. So I'll move it right up against the edge of that bandsaw buddy. Probably stop it about a millimeter shy so that I'm not interfering with the bandsaw buddy at all. Yeah, I can easily see if there's a consistent gap. Lock that down, get it straight, and then we'll tighten these adjustment bolts. Okay, so now comes time for the test cut. And we're gonna ramp this up in difficulty. I've got this bit of paduk here, and what I need to do is rip off both bark edges of this, and then put those over the planer, get them nice and square, as well as one face flat. And then we're gonna get that piece upright, and I'm gonna try and resaw this into three 15 millimeter thick, give or take components, but we'll measure them end to end to make sure there's no taper and it's consistent across the entire thing. Should be a fun test. Right, so let's measure the thickness, or I'll just get the middle one. Thickness of these, see what we've ended up with. So we'll measure it corner to corner. To start with 13.9 millimeters, 13.8, that's pretty good. So we're not drifting at all over the length. Now this is gonna indicate if it's cutting out of square or not slightly. Oh, 13.8 and ah, oh, 13.4. We were within 0.1 of a millimeter then. It's just dropped off at the end here, possibly as the pressure changed when I was changing from pushing forwards to dragging it back. Yeah, so we're within a 0.6 of a millimeter tolerance. Yeah, three out of four corners to within 0.1 of a millimeter tolerance. I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> I think that's to within tolerance. So as I said earlier, if you're interested in getting hold of this machine or even just the bandsaw buddy, great little attachment to help you set up the machine, then there's links in the description to where you can get hold of those. But as always, I hope you found the video useful. If you did, press the like button. That would really help me out. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next video.